Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So today's video is all about the equine skeleton and it's broken down into two parts. We're going to do the forelimb or the thoracic limb and we're going to do the hind limb or the pelvic limb and it's going to be done by Paul Conroy. He's going to go over it all. Um, he's one of the lecturers up at Mysco College and it's where I'm doing the degree course um, but he also lectures and he's one of the tutors there for the diploma course as well. So he's a great guy, he's full of knowledge. Um, a little bit of an informal session that we did with the degree students um, and it's basically because at the end of the first year you have a live horse examination um, so we went over all those points. So we look at the we look at the skeleton, we look at the bones individually, we look at uh, the lumps and bumps on these bones and we try and figure out what's actually going on, how it actually aids in horse locomotion. So yeah, let's get to it guys. I hope you enjoy this video and you're able to learn something from it. Let's jump straight in. Part of the key to being good at live horse observations is being able to see this when the skin and the fur and all of that is on. If you can't see this mental, you can't make this mental picture, it starts to become difficult to then be able to spot which bones which, and someone says, oh, Sean, it was a scapula. All right, and, and this afternoon we'll, we'll go through, we'll do a session on, on it on a, on a real live horse, but we'll just go through some uh, sort of anatomy uh, uh, with the horse, but we'll concentrate on, first of all, the forelimbs, or what we call the thoracic limb. So, if you all, well, if you all, if you all see that, if you come round to the front of the horse, that this attachment here, all right, that this bone has no mechanical attachment whatsoever to uh, the axial skeleton. So the horse is divided into the axial and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is the head, the spinal cord, the ribs, and the appendicular skeleton are the legs. Okay, and the legs are divided into the thoracic and the pelvic limb. And you can see in the thoracic limb there is no mechanical attachment. It's quite an unusual sort of thing this and it's called a, a syncycosy joint or it's quite a specialised joint. All right, and it's what gives the horse its large range of movement in the forelimb. It's held via uh, major muscles and things like that. So the first bone of the forelimb is the scapula and the scapula is a long bone. Okay, So long bones occur in the body uh, for two specific reasons. One is for the protection of vital organs, so the skull is a good example of it, flat and bone. the ribs, flat bones. Yeah, not yeah? Long bone. yeah? Did I say long bone? <laughs> Dude, it's too long. Okay, uh, flat bone. So this is a flat bone, alright? So flat bones, two functions. One is the protection of vital organs, but in this case, it's a broad surface for the attachment of muscles, okay? And that's what this particular bone is for. It has a piece of cartilage, okay, that extends the bone <coughs> in this position, okay, it basically comes up in this region here and it comes around, alright, and it extends this dorsal edge of the bone up to roughly the point of the highest point of the withers. Obviously it didn't survive the pickling process or the preparation process, but uh, this cartilage helps to absorb concussion and, and in older horses it starts to turn to bone and you can clearly see on this particular horse that this area here is the bone shouldn't be here, all right? If this was all cartilage, the, scap the, the scapula would end here, all right? So this will help us to tell that this particular horse was uh, an aging horse, okay? But it is a flat bone, all right? It's called a scapula and it's got this ridge uh, that runs down it. The next bone is the humerus, all right? And the humerus has a characteristic twist to it as it goes down, okay? And it has uh, two tuberosities. Before we were talking about tuberosities and I said the tuberosity was a raised roughened area for the attachment of uh, muscles and things okay and you can see that the, the humerus here has two tuberosities a large one here called the deltoid tuberosity and there's a much smaller one on the inside called the tres major tuberosity and they are for the deltoid and the tres major muscles okay and then we get down here if you all come around here slightly we get to our first mechanical lock all right and before we were talking about the, uh, the elbow lock, okay, and this is the elbow lock. So we've got this bone here, which is uh, the ulna. And the ulna is made up of the ulna and uh, the olcranon, all right, but they're fused together and essentially we know it as the ulna. And you can see that it thins out and it attaches to the radius via a fibrous joint, okay. And a fibrous joint is a joint that allows little to no movement, okay. So on the top of our uh, Olcranon process, you can see there's a large tuberosity. Can you see the, the raised roughened area? Okay. <coughs> so you've got the 
uh, tricep muscle, okay, the triceps brachii muscle essentially fills this area here and it comes down and it attaches to this area. So it has a tendon that attaches onto, onto the olcranon process. Underneath that tendon is, is a bursa, okay, a, a, a congenital bursa called a tricipital bursa and on top of it is a subcutaneous bursa and like we talked about before, enlargement of that subcutaneous bursa would be capped elbow in horses. So what happens is the quadricep muscle will hold a small amount of tension okay, on this bone and it will pull it up. Can you see how, see the effects that has? Takes the knee back. See how it pushes the knee straight back? <clears throat> okay, and what happens is this little notch that you see inside here is called the ancaneal process and this hole in the bone is called the olcranon fossa. All right, a fossa is a small depression in the bone. On the other side of the humerus, there's another small fossa here, and that's called the radial fossa. So you've got the olcranon fossa and the radial fossa. So tension on this muscle essentially locks the ancaneal process into the olcranon fossa. And because, detach myself from the ribs, because all these, these here only move that way, all right, once that, pulls it back, everything then becomes locked into place. The only thing left to do at that point is the suspensory apparatus, we went through the anatomy of it all before, all the sesmoidian ligaments, the collateral ligaments, the annular ligaments, so on and so forth, is to hold up the fetlock and the suspensory ligament being uh, the main component of that. So, Paul, once it's pulled that into that lock position, can it then reduce the, its muscle usage? Once yes, it's locked in but, but it still requires tension being held on it, which obviously will, will generate fatigue yeah. in the muscle. But remember that this muscle has an increased fibrous content, so its tendency to fatigue is greatly reduced. And that's yeah. the triceps? Yeah, that's triceps, triceps brachii right, right, muscle. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the biceps brachii muscle, okay, originates here and it comes round, all right, and do you remember, it comes round and it inserts onto this tuberosity, yeah. all right, do you remember just before it inserts, it forms a lassitus fibrosus, all right? And um, it forms two tendons. It has a short one that attaches here, and then it throws out a long branch, which then comes all the way down. And as it comes down, it starts to merge with the extensor carpa radialis, all right? And finally inserts onto that tuberosity here, okay? At the front, Alex, you said before, was it, was it medial, medial lateral? lateral? And I said lateral, it's actually quite central. Right. All right, it is quite central, all right? In fact, if anything, it's slightly medial to lateral. Okay. Yeah, I can't quite remember which one it was. So you've got the biceps muscle comes round. All right, at this point here, it throws out two tendons. One inserts here, and the second one, the long branch of it, merges with the extensor carpa radialis and inserts here. All right, but the lassitus fibrosus, because it is fibrous and it's not a muscle, again, does not fatigue. So we've got the serratus ventralis wanting to pull it this way. We've got the biceps brachii countering that tendency to pull. It's got an increased fibrous content. This has got an increased fibrous content via the lassitus fibrous, fibrosus, okay? So essentially it keeps everything in equilibrium. Tension being held on here, pulls everything back, <coughs> locking the bony column. So you've got yin and yang balance up here because of what we just talked about. We've got the lock here, all right? And essentially the whole falling is, is immobilized, all right? without the use of muscle fatigue. And all we've got then got left is this postural sway which happens naturally where the muscles are gonna to have to relax and contract on either side just to keep its center of mass centralized over it. And a good analogy is obviously <coughs> on a windy day, those muscles are gonna to have to work harder to keep it centralized because you've got the out external influence of the wind blowing things across. Uh, same on hill, hilly ground and things like that. But, uh, so that's the first sort of mechanical lock. This bone here is the radius, and if you stand at the side, you can see that it's got a slight curve to it, okay? Which is perfectly uh, normal for the, for the radius. So, if you all, all want to go around to the front, I'll just show you a, a little, uh, or I'll talk you through a little, uh, not tricks the wrong word, but uh, on your examinations, uh, you may get, if there's a radio, you know, if there's an x-ray element to your uh, exam, Quite often they'll show you the knee, or the anatomy of the knee, and ask you to point out various bits of anatomy, all right? So if we go through our knee, we've got two rows of carpal bones, okay? Proximal row and distal row. Now on the proximal row, you've got the radiocarpal bone, which is medial, and the ulnar carpal bone, which is lateral, all right? The ulna is lateral, so the ulnar carpal bone is lateral, 
okay? Now, sometimes if you get an x-ray shot that isn't truly dorsal palmar, it's slightly off, okay? Sometimes these two bones can look very similar in size and it's hard for you then, you, you, what you're looking for is the bigger bone because you know that that's the radiocarpal bone, therefore you know whether it's a left four or it's a right four. But if you just look at these two pointy bits here, can you see them? Okay, these are known as the styloid processes, all right, and you can clearly see that the medial styloid process is much larger than the lateral styloid process. These two, the styloid processes are where the capsular ligaments arise for the knee, all right. So the knee has one outer fibrous layer and three separate synovial pouches inside that, okay, and two and three can the synovial fluid can communicate with each other so it can go between the two but the top one is self-contained okay so you have one outer fibrous layer and three separate synovial pouches and they originate here on these styloid processes so when you look at an x-ray and you're just trying to decide which is medial and which is lateral it really doesn't matter trying to decide which is the larger of the two bones simply look for the larger of the two styloid processes and that will instantly tell you that that this is medial and that's lateral yeah little trick on an exam should you ever come across one that's not quite you can't decide whether it's a left four or a right four all right instead of trying to decipher which one of these bones is bigger just look for the larger uh, stylo process okay so we've got so we've got two rows of carpal bones we've got the proximal row and the distal row and you can see with the knee that it's quite uniformed and it's quite easy to learn all right the hop not quite is because everything's offset slightly and it doesn't quite marry up as well as you as well as it does in the forelimb. But you've got essentially three bones. You've got the radiocarpal bone, my hand my finger on it, the radiocarpal bone, the intermediate or the intercarpal bone, and the ulnocarpal bone. Alright, they make up the proximal row and the distal row are simply the same as the bones that they're sat on. So this will be the second, the third, and the fourth carpal bone and round the back here you've got the accessory carpal bone that you can see is angled in slightly. Is it normal for the knees both of them they slightly face yeah. laterally? Yeah yeah it, yeah I think the way that it's strung up do you know what I mean and been drilled it does it has turned them out slightly I think they're a little bit more central than that right but yeah I, I understand what you I know what you're saying it's just kind of the way that it's you know because it's held in with these more like that. It's actually got P3s are on the wrong. Does that force them to go toe in then, even when the knees are straight? Is that? Uh, no. I mean, there's a saying that horses are born, <coughs> they're born toe out and die toe in, which is kind of true. You know, you look at foals; they are they are toe out, but as the chest then comes out, they then straighten up, and, yeah. and then obviously what we do to them in the lifetime and all of that, they end up slowly turning in. But. Uh, that's the way it is. So anyway, so and back to the knee. So we've got, we've done the bones. So we essentially we've got three joints. We've got this joint, this joint, and this joint. Okay. So we've got the radiocarpal joint, the intercarpal joint, and the carpometacarpal joint. All right. So they're the three joints that make up the knee. And then we've got uh, lower limb, which I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going through. I'm damn sure you all know all the bones. Third metacarpal, second, fourth, proximal phalanx. Uh, sorry, proximal sesamoids, proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx. Okay? Okay, guys, thanks for watching. That was part one. So we are going to do part two with Paul. Uh, so that will come up on the next video, uh, probably towards the end of next week. Um, but, yeah, thank you very much, for Paul, for taking the time to do this video with us. Um, as I said, it's part of the degree course, so any, any sort of videos that we can make that helps us to revise this topic is uh, a bonus. So I'll drop a link to Paul's uh, YouTube channel here, so be sure to check that out. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Check out some of my other videos here and here, and I shall see you all on the next video. Take care.